Welcome to Watercolour Splashes. I'm Lorraine Brown and my artist life is all about watercolour. There is never just one way to paint, but in Watercolour Splashes I will show you what works for me with tips, techniques and experiments that you can try for yourself. Be inspired. Let's watercolour splash. Well, I've come into my studio this morning pretty excited because last night my husband bought me back a um, bit of a, a branch from a tree that was in blossom that he found when he was out uh, doing his rowing practice last night. And I'm going to see what I can do with it today. I'd like to perhaps incorporate a bird in it. And just in the last few days, we've had a lot of honey eaters in the garden. They've been landing on our camellia bushes, but I'm going to see how I can combine a honey eater in with the blossom. I'm thinking perhaps out of focus background, somewhere for the bird to sit, um, not put all of the blossom in, not absolutely sure how much of it I'm going to put in. But what I'm going to do is try and combine the two. This is a honey eater. This is a big picture so that I've got something to paint from, but he's, he's really a very small bird. So I've just got to get him in scale to the uh, blossom and the twigs that I've got here. Uh, I think I'll just do one bird. I may even incorporate some ink into this as well. I'm not sure. I'll see how I go once I get going. So uh, I have to think about a little bit of composition because I need to know where the bird's going to sit and what his scaling will be. But outside of that, I'll probably make all of it up as I go along. So I hope you enjoy watching this uh, painting come, hopefully, to a finish. To get my bird in perspective size to my blossom, I've had a few attempts at uh, getting the size right on a separate piece of paper, in this case on a piece of tracing paper, and, um, you know, tried the sizes of my birds out on here. Eventually, I have got it right. So what I do is I put my bird drawing on a light box, position my piece of paper over the top, and get the bird in position of where I want it to be and then lightly draw the outline of the bird. So I can be happy that I've placed him in the correct place on my piece of paper that I'm happy with and I've got him in the size that I want and then I have to think about how that's going to work with the blossom. So when I look at it, I'm going to almost be able to paint my blossom um, life size, which is quite nice. Um, I'm going to use some masking fluid because I don't want to use masking fluid for all of the white um, uh, flowers, but the little stamens in the middle, it'd be nice to have some of those left white that I could um, uh, get to show off against the um, uh, green part inside the blossom. So I'm going to next do a little bit of masking. I'm also going to do some masking on the bird because where he has uh, light white um, feathers that come out into the background, I will mask those out so that if I put some dark colour in behind, take the masking fluid off when I finish the painting, I've got nice white feathers um, going out into a dark background. So that's my next step, to do a little bit of masking. Not a great deal because I hate using the stuff. I always seem to put it down quite poorly and have funny shapes to fix up afterwards. But in an instance like this, it is um, going to be necessary. So first off, I'm going to have a little play with colours. I always like to try and find something new to use just to keep it interesting to me because often you've painted white flowers so many times you want to try and find something a bit different. And um, so I'm, I've put out a few little sample colours here. They may make the grade, they may not. 
but uh, until you try, you don't know, but it's good to try on a separate piece of paper. So this is Oriolin here, and I definitely want to use that in the yellow of the bird, but I'm also perhaps going to be able to use it somewhere in these flowers or even to make the green. So my next step would be to take the yellow and see what it's like with a blue that I've picked out. And I've got Prussian blue here, which is a color I haven't used for such a long time, but I've just started in the last week or so and I'm loving it. So um, I'll see if I can make this work in my painting for a green. That's really, really nice. And then maybe I could use that same blue to help me make the black dark color for the bird. So what am I going to put that with? I'm thinking maybe alizarin, alizarin crimson. I'm going to get a really dark purple if I do this, which I then might be able to turn into a color dark enough to read black. It doesn't have to be black, it's just got to read black. So if I put that on, I get a very, very dark color, which could be far more interesting than thinking you're just going to paint it black. So I'm thinking this might do the job for me. So what I've got so far, Oriolin, Prussian Blue, and alizarin crimson that's the permanent alizarin crimson but i'm also seeing the lovely pink in here there's a pink tinge to some of the blossom there's the pink at the base of the stamens um, so it could be a combination of that alizarin crimson but also i'm thinking of trying to put a little bit of this lovely opera in there that will give it a nice bit of bright brightness um, so can i do it with those four colors one, two, three, four. The stem, the branches, I should say, are a, um, I think because it's a fairly uh, um, new, new part of the season just coming in, there's a lot of greenery on these stems. I've also got to think about my background. So I've pulled out a new colour here, which I haven't been able to use very much and do anything yet, which is called yellow grey. Could I possibly use those for the stem combined with something like this? Let's just have a look. So that's very red. If I put a little bit of the blue in there, if I can't get this to work, then I'll go back to my stock standard burnt sienna. Um, but it would be nice to be able to think if I'm trying to do something new, but I don't know. I can certainly get a tweak color out of that. And maybe it might be good to use something like that in the background. So there we go. Let's put them out so I've got this yellow-grey, the Oriolin, Prussian blue, opera, and alizarin crimson. Well, there's my aim. Now, when you start painting, it's good to have done this first because you can make your decisions on something like this and not on your painting and then find you don't like it. But it doesn't mean that as you're painting, you can't change your mind. So as I'm going along, if I think it's just not doing it, then I will think of something else as I'm going. But it's nice to have had a bit of theory sorted out before you put that first brush stroke down there. Well, I've masked out. This is on a half sheet in portrait uh, format. It's a piece of high white Saunders Waterford 425 GSM cold press paper. And as I say, I might even use some ink in here, so I'm going to get that ready just in case. It's no good thinking about uh, using it. You don't have it on your table all ready to go. But then I'm going to start probably with the background and probably adding some water first and trying to do a little bit wet into wet. I haven't masked out the white flowers. I've only masked out some centers. 
So I'm going to have to be mindful as I'm putting a background in here to leave myself plenty of white uh, shapes big enough to do the petals. So scary bit to come, that first brush stroke on the paper, um, but then it's fun after that. I spend some time adding the water to the paper and this serves as two things. A, it's going to let me be able to paint wet into wet, but it's also thinking time as I'm putting the water down, I feel like I'm already starting the painting because I'm thinking what this is going to look like when this has got paint there. If you put the water down and you've put it somewhere and you think, well, I don't want the paint to have run into there, this is the time that you could easily just blot it up with a, um, a tissue and um, then the paint won't run into there once you get painting. As my confidence grows, um, and I'm feeling more comfortable with what I'm doing, I drop in more colour. So if I think it's going to be too light, I start adding more colour. Um, but going at things slowly and softly at the beginning means you can actually warm up into a painting instead of going in too heavy and uh, trying to back it out. It's much easier to add paint than it is to take it away. carefully avoid the shape of the bird because I want to paint him on the top. I also uh, make sure I leave plenty of little white areas for the blossom um, and I'm going to just work on that in the later part. work my way down the painting, adding colour, some splashes, little marks for leaves. None of this is finished. This is all the first wash going down. All of this will either be strengthened and turned into something or um, just left as little abstract marks. This type of way of painting, you're not copying a photo, you're just making things up looking at your reference, in my case here, those stems of the um, blossom, and just making marks that you like the look of, you like the colour of, and hopefully are going to read into something interesting in your painting. So it's a matter of really just getting paint down there, giving yourself something to play with when it dries, but you've got to get some colour on the paper. I'm doing now I'm using the colors that I've put in the top and I'm starting to lift out paint to get a sort of soft diffuse out of focus look for the background.
painting the bird, I do this more carefully. The bird actually is a focus on here. I want him to retain his shape and look like a proper honey eater, so I'm carefully making the marks. I'm looking at my reference and I'm making sure I leave the white um, uh, feathers on his um, body. I have some masking fluid on there, so I know in places I can go over. So I'm just using the nice strong mix that I practiced with on my scrap at the beginning and dropping in the colors and bringing this little bird to life. I make sure I dry the bird so that that dark paint doesn't flow out into the background. I'm now moving around the painting, adding stems, bringing out darker shapes behind the white spaces that I've left for the blossom, and just slowly building up the painting. I'm actually not using ink in this, I've just used my combination of paints that I tried at the beginning, mixing up interesting grey browns for the twigs and, and branches. And for the flower centres, little hints of the reds and the greens in those white spaces help bring out the blossom petals.
I continue to work my way around the painting, trying to move from one place to another so that I don't overwork any one part, one part of it. So I'm moving into painting the branches. Then I might swap and paint into some of the blooms and really just keep working around the painting as a whole until I am happy.
I make sure everything is dry before I take the masking fluid off so I can do those final little touches in the blooms and any little parts that need uh, a bit of attention. just adding some final touches to the centres of the flower, mindful that I don't lose all of the whites that I retained with the masking fluid. And of course there's always a bit of splashes and at the very end when I think I have said all I need to say, I put a signature on it which hopefully is telling me to leave it alone. I hope you've enjoyed watching this watercolour splashes demo. I enjoyed doing this painting. It's a cute little bird. I love the fact that I had the live blossom on my table. So until next time, bye.